Hello everyone, I'm Susan Birch, the health detective, and today I want to introduce you to a really fantastic guest. Her name is Sumi Singh, and I'm going to let her tell you about herself, but um, you're going to get a lot out of this podcast today, I'm sure. Sumi, thanks for coming along. Thanks so much for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. So um, my name is Sumi Singh and I'm a personal trainer here in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm 45 now and I started uh, being a trainer since my early 20s. So I've got over two decades of experience in this field. I compete in masters powerlifting and I've been doing that for the past five years. And prior to that, I did a whole lot of stuff just kind of surrounding aesthetics and fitness. I was a fitness model prior to the whole Instagram, <laughs> Insta fame stuff. So I've actually been in catalogs and stuff like that. Um, and I've written a book called Mom Strong, which is a book I wrote after having my daughter. And I wanted to come up with a book that was simple, which had all the exercises and nutrition and kind of the troubleshooting that tends to happen when you're a new mom. So I think a lot of moms think that they can just kind of jump right back into training right after having a baby and expect that things were just like the way that they were. And of course your whole life is in upheaval after having a child. So that's kind of why I wrote this book saying that you can still do this, but just it just takes a little bit and you can get started from there. Yeah, it's about just being a little bit kind and patient with yourself, isn't it? Yes, all that. Exactly right. So thanks. You sent me a copy of the book and it's fantastic. And one of the things I particularly like about it, uh, what we talk about today, which is coping with all the pressures of being a new mum, trying to look after the baby, keeping the house clean, everyone else's expectations and mm -hmm. finding time for yourself to do things for yourself. Mm -hmm. But the other plug I want to give for your book are the photographs in it. And all the exercises are there, really clear photographs. So if nothing else, that's a great resource for people. And you've also got a YouTube channel where people can watch how to do the exercises with correct form. That's right. Actually, you know, Lyle McDonald, who was on your show a couple of weeks ago, he actually did all the videos and all the photographs for that book. And he's edited the book as well. So I believe it has his blessing since <laughs> he did do that. And um, yeah, they're, they're definitely do along with videos that, are, that go along with the book too. And they're meant to be really, really short workouts. So, you know, you're not expected to be hitting the gym doing hour long workouts. They should take you 20 minutes at least as, as a start. So why do you think that <clears throat> short workouts in that situation are so important because I think a lot of women think I haven't got time to do anything because I can't you know it takes I've got to do a workout at the gym for an hour it takes 20 minutes to get there I've got to clean up afterwards I think there's a big expectation that you're supposed to do it all which is kind of what the pressure is on today's modern mom that they're supposed to you know, look amazing and take care of the kid and take care of the household, take care of the husband, be back at work in six weeks. And there's just an expectation that they kind of go back to normal as, as if things aren't different and they really are. So I think the number one thing that I really say is you just got to start small. It really doesn't matter what it is. I mean, it could be a 10 minute walk because that might be all that you really get. And if that's, you know, that's all you get, that's perfectly fine. That's a good place to start. And, you know, think about adding like little chunks of you know, workout throughout your day or whatever it is. You don't have to even approach it like a workout. It could be anything because um, your life is pretty much um, been up, up, you know, an up upheaval now. So whatever you can get, it's a good place to start. And I like to think about, you know, one good habit leading to another. So if you're able to do 10 minutes a day for the first two weeks or three weeks, you know, after that time, if you're able to layer on a little bit more time, just as the baby gets a little bit older and your schedule, at least you start to understand your schedule a bit more. I think that's a good place to start. Just think of small habits leading to bigger and better habits. So I love, I love the idea about habits because I think, well, I'm going to ask you, what do you think about getting overtired in your workouts as a new mum? I think you're, yeah, I mean, the first, <laughs> at least I, from my own experience, I know that the first nine months were like a giant uh, experiment in sleep deprivation. I don't think I got very much sleep if, I mean, I was pretty much a walking zombie. So I think that <laughs> if you're going to go in with the expectation that you're going to have super energized workout, if you're in the kind of state that I was in, you're sorely mistaken. Like you're going to be tired and it might be your situation for the next God knows how long. So the key is that when you're feeling, when you're feeling good and just a little bit, just 
just a small amount of work, like whether it's 10 squats or whether it's 10 push-ups or whatever you can manage, keep in mind that, you know, being strong is going to help you as a mother, because just think about all the things that you have to do when you're a mom, which is, you know, picking up, picking up the baby and lifting her up from different positions and putting her in the car seat and car seats are super bulky and awkward. Like all those things that you have to do to be a mother require you to be strong. So whatever small amount that you can do is going to help pay off dividends in the future. So. Yeah, so those tiny habits, you know, if you turn the kettle on and do 10 squats while you're waiting for it to boil or something anything. like that. <laughs> literally you know? anything. Yes, literally yeah. anything. So, I mean, in the, in, in the book, I mean, there are specified workouts, but you don't have to follow them all from front to back, whether you're able to get in just a couple of repetitions here and there, think about, and it doesn't have to be strength training if that's not where you start. And if you start with, you know, walks or doing YouTube videos or joining mom groups and, you know, getting ideas from other mothers or, you know, countless mommy and me classes that you can bring your baby along to once she's old enough, then that's a great place to start. So I think if you, if you think of, you know, I'm just too tired, I just can't, okay, yeah, sure, surely for the first couple of days you get back in the hospital, that's going to be the case. No one expects you to be doing much of anything other than if you're lucky enough to get a shower sometimes, that's all you can do. That's really all you can do. But at some point you have to find the time to take for your own self-care and I don't, it's always different for every single woman. Like it could be, it could be, you know, it could be a walk, it could be a hike, it could be anything really, stretching, yoga, just start somewhere, start small, because something is always going to be better than nothing. And what about for mental health with that? You know, like those first few days of being a new mom, you've got all that emotional roller coaster that you go through um, and just that damn fatigue. I mean, I just remember, <laughs> I still remember the fatigue. <laughs> I mean, I think mental health is one of the things that is just not spoken of enough. And it's not just the first couple of days of coming back from the hospital. That sort of thing, unfortunately, can last months if it's not treated properly. Um, and I think it just goes back to all the, all the added stress that is expected for women these days just kind of layers upon you. And whether it's a truly a hormonal thing or, you know, you feel like you're not getting enough support. Because I can tell you, um, in my own experience, I, as a single parent, I, it, was, it was hard to feel supported and so that was, that's really one thing and you, the guilt and the burden and everything is, is on you unless you're the kind of person and I wasn't, and, and you know, in hindsight, it's always 2020, right? Like you, you should reach, like you really, if it's a message I could say is reach out and, and get support from whoever and however many people, whether it's, if you have family nearby or, you know, brothers or sisters, other mothers in like, luckily now, now there's Facebook back when, when I was pregnant and, you know, back when you were, there wasn't Facebook groups or communities like there are now. And mm -hmm. you can reach out and find other people in your neighborhood, mommy shares, just other people you can reach out to, to get support is really important. I mean, not just of all these stresses that are on women, but also, you know, women who, you know, just have babies, they're, they think that their bodies are not theirs anymore, right? Especially if you're breastfeeding, your body belongs to somebody else and your body looks so different. Like, I know that even after six weeks, I kind of came back to my normal pre-baby weight, but things looked completely different. So yeah, yeah. And if you are the kind of person who ties a lot of your self-worth to how you look, um, that is going to add to a woman's mental stress. So you really have to take the long-term approach and think, you know, it's going to take a lot longer than six weeks. And I think that's for some reason, that's the magic number for women. I don't know why, but <laughs> it just is, you know, in America, women are expected to return to work pretty much six weeks after having the baby because that's when typical maternity leave is over. And it, might, it may have changed now, but it, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a job that allows you to stay home longer, but if that's one of those things, if you're expected to get back to work all of a sudden and so quick, that's just another thing that you're added on stress-wise. It, really, it is really hard and hopefully that's changing, but that, that takes some concerted effort on the part of the mom to make sure she finds time you know, to take for herself. We get six months paid maternity leave nice. now, which is good and then I think it's 12 months you get 12 months maternity leave but six months of it's paid so it does give mm -hmm. women that little bit of time to bond with their baby with guilt-free oh, and some financial support um, oh that's wonderful yeah I mean that, that that's not the case here and I, again I don't know if it's just the typical of what's expected of a lot of American women, but they are expected to just get things together, you know, get their life back 
in order in short time and it's just not how it works now that is definitely a big part of the mental health thing in addition to you know just how you feel in your body and you know you know if you if you're the kind of person who thinks that i'm gonna get back to the gym and my body's gonna perform the way i expected it to perform pre-baby that's even more disheartening for a lot of women who cannot wrap their mind around the fact that it takes a long time to get back some sometimes I mean, some women are able to bounce back super quickly but you know the average woman is going to take a lot longer than she expects you know maybe nine months because that's how long we were pregnant maybe even longer depending and i love that you touched on about getting support because that's something that i think is a bit of a stigma around is asking for help and mm -hmm. saying can you come and you know, can you come and look after my baby while I go and go for a walk or <laughs> while I go and have a shower or I go and have a facial or, oh, sure. or you know, and there's probably something from my generation or from my parents' generation and then my generation where it's possibly, <clears throat> I hope it's changing, but where we kind of think, oh, well, we didn't have help, so why can't you cope, you right. know? Right. And that's, that's just not, that's not just a new mom thing. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you deal with that too, but like I have clients who've had babies and they've had, you know, they're, they're still are grown, their children are teenagers. And yet they still yeah. have a hard time with guilt and taking time away from themselves and finding ways that, and I, 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 it's largely cultural probably, and, it, and maybe it's different from culture to culture, but here, you know, it's, it, if you take any time for yourself, you're considered selfish, which is of course, total nonsense. Yeah. You can't, yeah, I don't believe, I mean, a stronger mom is always going to be a better, better mom and whether that's physical and mental, but all the ways that you find to recharge yourself, you definitely should take it. Like I said, self-care looks different from, for every single, every single woman. Mm. Right? And do you think, do you think that self, self-care is a really important, important message to be giving to our children as well? That we're not just totally sacrificing ourselves all the time for our kids that we put some boundaries up and we go yeah I'm a person too and I have these needs as well and I'm a better mum when I take some time out to take care of myself absolutely yeah no absolutely I think I mean kids I think kids initially are really good about self-soothing like self-soothing like they, they learn when they're younger how to self-soothe so so for some kids it's you know they want to be alone in their room and some kids they want to cuddle with their mom but they have to learn the tools to self-soothe and um, they are learning from us all the time, whether we like it or not. We are constantly role modeling everything for them, you know, and if we are the kind of like, I knew I was always going to do something athletic, which meant time away from my child. So, you know, as she got older, she would see that I have, and, and it's different as the kid gets older, you know, so at first, you know, after they're one or two, maybe they can take 10 minutes away from you. And they need to see that you're, you're doing something that is specifically for you, that they are learning that, you know, they are not the center of the universe and that's good. So we're not raising these entitled children who think that the whole world revolves around them. It's mm -hmm. different when they're infants. That's not what I'm talking about. But as they get older, they need to see you distancing themselves, doing things that are specifically for you. So my daughter has learned that, especially now that she's older, you know, she's 13. So she's seen that with powerlifting training, it takes hours, you know, and it's uninterrupted time because the distractions can be potentially very dangerous because you're handling really, really heavy weights. So she needs to learn that, you know, these are the two hours I need for myself. I don't want to be interrupted. I don't care what you do, but you're going to be in your room and here's a book, here's an iPad or whatever, you know, like don't yeah. bug me, <laughs> right? And so now she's older, she gets that, but you know, as she was getting older and older and older, we would, we'd try this out saying, I just want 10 minutes. I just want 20 minutes, but it's important that they learn that you're doing this for yourself and it's absolutely not selfish. It's so that you can come back and you're recharged and you're a better mother. So you know, in all ways, we're role modeling, whether it's with whatever we're doing in the kitchen and how we bring them along to the grocery store and what we do for exercise and how it's rewarding to us. They are watching and they are learning. And mm -hmm. hopefully they take those habits on themselves. But, you know, even if you think that they're not, trust me, they absolutely are. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, trust me, I've screwed up in many ways, but, <laughs> you know, and in, and in some, I feel like, okay, good. I think I've done a good job. So, and that's purely not, that's purely just from role modeling and not trying to lecture. Yeah, I think that's so important. And, you know, while a, a lot of your message or your book is really for new mums, your message is really to all mums of all ages or yeah. all women, all women of all ages, regardless of whether they're a mum or not. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, both of us see in our client base women who come in 
you know, I work mostly with probably women over 40, 45, perhaps, mm -hmm. and even older women who come in and feel like, well, now's my time. Like, how do I, how do I now claw back my life? And how do I now take care of myself? Because I've spent the last 20 years looking right. after everybody else. Right. And it's, and it's confusing, right? Because like, where, where do you begin? Let's say you're just a woman who wants to begin. I just, I want to start strength training. Where do I begin? There are just countless, countless, countless programs. And although my book is, yes, a lot of the troubleshooting and the initial goal setting stuff is really meant for a mom and how she can kind of incorporate strength training into her new crazy life. The actual strength training program and the cardiovascular progressions, everything in there is really meant for a true beginner. So somebody who's just like, I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? How many times a week do I have to lift? Like what sort of exercise should I be doing? It's, it's all very confusing to the new lifter. So in the book, what I try to do is just lay out a really simple progression. You know, it's, it's like full body workouts beginning twice a week for 20 minutes. And then as a woman gets stronger, how do you add on? What do you do? Do you, do you add more workouts? Do you add more reps? Like it's all spelled out there in the book, which is really meant for anybody who's coming brand new into strength training so it is it is basically a beginner strength training program that's meant for any woman and you know after eight to 12 weeks you know you'll know what to do after that how to get stronger like it is mainly designed to be done at home but there's no reason why you can't take the workout and do it at the gym too if that's what you prefer to do I, and I think being able to do home-based training especially in our environment today with you know you never know when you're going to be in a COVID lockdown yeah yes that's right <laughs> it's very true Yep. So knowing that you can do something in the lounge or the garage is mm -hmm. super, super important, I think. You're right. Exactly. exactly. It's, it's even more important with COVID because not, not, not only are, do we know about if gyms are opening and closing, but frequently there are like, you know, uh, restrictions on areas that you can use and yeah. times of day that you can go depending on where you live. So it's good to be creative and know you have options to do at home, whether it's, you know, in the gym or whatever, splitting it up. It doesn't really matter over the course of each course of any given week if you can get in the workouts here and there you're I think you're doing well I think we have a lot of we we are totally hung up on the fact that we have to do we are an all or nothing society everything is perfectionism and that's just never the way to go when you're a new parent and you're a busy parent or you're a busy mom with all kinds of responsibilities that lie you know outside of your control well I know even for myself now you know I mean I'm a grandma now and I don't you know there's just me and my dogs but my day can just go to hell sure. and my yeah. planned workouts and right. so I think what I try and do is I try and do something mm -hmm. so even if yeah. I don't do what I had planned I just try and go and do something even if it's for a few minutes so I'm maintaining that habit because it's really easy to skip one day and think, yep. oh, well, I'll skip yep. another day. And then sure. we have this, let's start on Monday mindset. So it's like, oh, well, I'll start again next week. <laughs> <laughs> Starting on Monday, that's all that matters. If Monday is your gauge and your reset button, I say absolutely go for it. But the yeah. same same philosophy, which you said, which is called like the what the hell effect. Like, okay, well, I've missed one workout, might as well miss them all. It's the same thing that people do with food and dieting and nutrition is like, you know, they're quote unquote good for like one day, they have one meal off plan and all of a sudden everything's in the toilet, which is, it's very funny, <laughs> you know, if we could just kind of get people to come more of the middle of the road approach, I think we're doing better as much as we can get that message out there. So. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always say to people, if you missed having a shower for a day, you don't go, <laughs> what the hell, I'm never going to have another shower again, or right. I'm never going to clean my teeth again, you know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, that's a very funny analogy, right? That's not yeah. a good thing to talk about. <laughs> no. So. no. So can you talk a little bit about the benefits of strength training? Because I know that you love being strong and you're an incredibly strong woman and we'll we'll talk a little bit about kind of your powerlifting, um, which I absolutely admire. <laughs> but can you talk a little bit about the benefits of being strong? You were talking about, you know, being able to handle your child and things like that. But even, you know, like women my age, why it's so important that we are strong. I'm yeah. going to talk to Lyle again about men perimenopause and menopause and that yeah. kind of thing. But if you've got something to jump in there about helping sure. with that as well. Sure. I mean, he'll speak, I'm sure, very generally about, um, you know, and I can too, is just, you know, as, as you age, you lose bone mineral density. So I know that we're not, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're not thinking about that. You know, you don't think about, oh yeah, whatever, I could 
you know, it doesn't matter what I do now because, you know, we're not thinking about those things, but the things that happen sort of underneath the trunk are really important as you get older, which is, you know, as you lose, you know, strength training is the only thing that's going to help you build bone mineral density as you get older. So unfortunately things like walking don't really do that unless you're super, super, you know, old or you're, you know, really a sedentary or you've come back from an injury, walking won't cut it. You do have to lift weights. You have to have some sort of external load on the joints that's going to get you stronger. So that's really important as you get older. You don't think about falling and being frail as you, you know, as you age, but unfortunately that's a big, that's one of the bigger risks for the elderly is, you know, people actually will get really, really hurt from falling. And that leads to, you know, you know, being in a hospital and that's not where you want to be right now. So that's, I think the number one thing about strength training that people don't think about. And, and of course you build muscle mass. And the only way to do that is through progressive overload. And that happens with strength training. So those are the two of the most important things that women may not consider because, you know, a lot of people will initially get into strength training because they want to look toned, which is great. I think that's a wonderful goal. Like people want to look better. And ultimately at the end of the day, people want to look good you know, and they want to feel good in their clothes. So, you know, they're saying, you know, toning or whatever, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, if you're just thinking about, you know, muscle tone, ultimately what it's going to lead to is more confidence, which is what you start to lose as, you know, as you get older, you know, you, you want to feel good about yourself. This is one of those things that I think people don't talk about enough is the, the mental health that happens when you're feeling confident, because that leads to if you're, if you're able to perform well in the gym, it makes you feel like you can do other tasks with ease. Like, you know that you've gotten onto the barbell and you've squatted, you know, whatever it is, a hundred pounds as a female. And that's a big accomplishment because then you think if I could do that, I could do all these other tasks, right? So there's a lot of confidence that happens. So confidence is a huge one, bone mineral density and increasing muscle mass as you get older. So I think Again, people will get into strength training for more of the aesthetic gains, but there's all kinds of other things that are happening underneath the hood that are really important for women. And it does affect hormonal balance through quite a lot, doesn't it? Although I don't know if that's your expertise area, but you know, it does improve hormonal balance. Yep, yep. I mean, I know that you're gonna cover that with Lyle. That's, that, that isn't my area of expertise, but... Um, I do think that if you cover that with Lyle, that'll be, he'll cover it more than, <laughs> more than you got your, <laughs> you can say he has one question and you're two hours later at the podcast with him, so I'm sure he'll go into that in detail, put a whole book on it, so. Yeah, it's, um, and it was a great book. Yeah. The, I think some of the things that I hear women say, especially as they get older, are things like, I hate my arms, I hate my tummy. And they feel like doing lo loads and loads of cardio is going to be what fixes that, you yeah. know? Yeah, and that doesn't happen all the time because, you know, that, that is a function of both, you know, lifting weights, being consistent. It takes time, especially if you're trying to, tor you know, target a certain, a certain area, like, you know, women will point to their arms or their triceps or whatever, but that, that is a function of, you know, proper diet, nutrition over time and dieting, I mean, and, you know, strength training and it's additive, right? It doesn't happen instantly. And you may be, uh, it, unfortunately for women, there are areas that are, you know, stubborn areas, which take a lot longer. And you may be looking at, if you've dedicated yourself to um, lifting consistently and proper nutrition, it may be something later down the line that you consider a, a cosmetic option. There are things like cool sculpting and uh, there, there are so many cosmetic options that I cannot even keep track of them. But the one that keeps coming up very frequently, at least for smaller pockets of areas of things like cool sculpting. But yeah, I don't know if you want to go down that rabbit hole, but um, I think people forget the, the, the whole thing is, is time. Everything takes time. It takes a whole lot longer than we wish. There's always these you know, things that come up on social media where transformations happen in 12 weeks. And so we're so accustomed to expecting results fast. And that's just never the case. I wish it were the case. I wish I could add you know, 20 pounds to my squat in 12 weeks, but it's just not going to happen at my training age, you know, unfortunately. So if you've been doing this long enough, uh, it just, you know, you, you come to learn that if you're not in love with the process um, and doing this, you're going to be in trouble. We have to expect that things take time, that there's a lot of, you know, real life stuff that happens, as you said, you know, and so give it, give it time and do some, you know, if then planning. So if something goes wrong, then I will do this. If, if I can't make it to the gym this week, well, I'll, you know, make it to the gym two or three times next week and it'll be fine. 
So mm. there's, there's a lot of contingency planning that people don't think of. Or I've got a home workout that I can do that I know that will, you know, keep me keep me going, keep the ha that habit forming going. Um, yep. I mean, it's, it's, it's super hard to be a female. We're expected to look, you're expected to look hot and you're expected to be, you know, uh, you know, we see countless, I mean, it's great. I, it's inspirational. I, you know, look at masters athletes that there are women in their fifties who are doing this, which is great. It's inspirational for me, but these are the exceptions. They're not everybody. So, yeah. for the, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but we're constantly being messaged that we're supposed to look super hot well into our forties and fifties and, um, you know, it's, it's tough. Like, you know, even, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm very lean and I'm, but I've been doing this for like 25 years. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, when people come to me saying like, I want to have X, Y, Z and it's like, well, great. And it only took me like 20 years to get there. <laughs> it's not a message that everybody wants to hear. Like I'm very lean and I'm able to maintain a certain level of leanness because I've been doing this for so, so long. So the amount of muscle mass that I have, you know, I work really hard to maintain, like I lift six times a week, you know, my training takes two or three hours a day. And I don't, you know, and I say that and people are like, okay, I can see why you are the way you are. Mm -hmm. The exceptions to the rule are because they work super, super, super hard and, or they have, you know, fantastic genetics, you know, there's all kinds of things that are happening behind, you know, closed doors that people don't talk about or willing to admit to that, you know, we should be talking about. Mm -hmm. So. And even at, you know, whatever 16% body fat, or I can be, you know, super lean and even leaner than that, even at 13% body fat, I still had cellulite. I still had soft spots. I still had parts of my body that may I not, I may not have loved, but so what? Like, I mean, mm. that's what I mean. I just think that there, there's always going to be something women are so hard on themselves and it's, it's, it's not just us. It's trickling down to the generation of our babies who, you know, yeah. they have. I mean, they have, you know, you have teenagers and tweens looking at Instagram and perfect bodies and, you know, everything is a filter. Like we didn't have this when we were growing up. Like if, you know, even in the magazine, sure they were Photoshopped. They're nothing like the images you can see on Instagram or wherever that are just picture perfect, super flawless. There isn't a mark on anyone's bum. There's not a pimple. There's not a, <laughs> there's not a shred of cellulite. And that's total hogwash. Cause like I said, even at my leanest, I still, I still had parts that were like, soft you know mm. Mm. excellent message and you talked in there also about dialing in the nutrition do you want to talk a little bit about the nutrition because I think that's an area where in today's age there's so much misconceptions about right. about food and what we should be eating and also this tendency to reward our hard days with food or reward I, I still see women yeah posting on Facebook you know I went and rode my bike for 20k so now I'm enjoying you know the the chocolate yeah. cake <laughs> um there there that, that let's tackle that second part of the question because that's a really good one I think that if you are trying to diet or lose fats um rewarding yourself with a food treat can be a very 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 slippery slope and so I tell my clients you know know yourself if after you know um a week of being good you feel like you can have a cupcake or whatever i don't care people have their own things that, that make them happy it could be cookies it could be cake i don't care what it is but if you're able to limit yourself to that one slice or whatever and it doesn't throw your diet off great by all means incorporate that but you may learn that that one slice of cake or one cookie is just a slippery slope to an entire box of cookies or an all-night binge so it's super, super, super important to know yourself and then learn from your mistake. Like if you figured out that you are going to go to the restaurant and you're not only you're going to have the wine and the appetizer and the entree and the dessert, like if, you know, if, <laughs> if you figured out that that's, that's going to blow your diet, then, you know, maybe the next time you go to a restaurant, you just have the one glass of wine or limit it to like whatever, you, you know, your protein and your veggies and have one treat. Like you have to figure out what your strategy is if you are going to be the kind of person who will use a food reward. There's nothing wrong with that, but learn from whatever it is that went wrong or if it went right, then great, keep incorporating it. Um, but I'd rather see somebody do a non-food reward. And again, that kind of ties back to what we we're talking about with regards to self-care and that looks different for everybody. So maybe for you, um, a reward would be getting a pedicure or a manicure or a massage 
or, you know, going out with your girlfriends or I have no idea with every single woman, it's different. Like, you know, it could be getting a facial, it could be going to get a spray tan. It could be a new outfit. If you have the means to go shopping and do, you know, retail therapy, then great. If that's how you reward yourself. then I say, that's how you should do it. And you should absolutely find a ways to reward yourself. Like, you know, nobody should be suffering like an athlete. Like I can do it, but you know, but it's different for an athlete where we're expected to suffer and some people actually enjoy it. Like, but I don't think that's what women should be doing. You know, suffering certainly is not what I'm saying that anyone should do. They have to figure out what reward works best for them, especially if they're looking at, you know, a really long path to, you know, their diet goals. Like if they've got 50 pounds to lose, it's going to take them a while. So Mm -hmm. they've got to pick up that journey into, you know, little bits and with every single mini milestone, they should absolutely be celebrating it in however, which way it looks, you know, great to them. And it could be anything. It could be a night of, you know, binge watching TV. I don't really know. <laughs> like everyone is so different in that reward, in that regard, rather. So, but I think that going back to your first question, which is, you know, more of a broader nutrition question, I think it's super, super hard for um, a woman in the current environment because, you know, back in our day, we'd have to go to the library or to the book stand and, you know, the magazines or whatever. Even like back then, there might have been a handful of books, but now there are just so many. If you were to go to, you know, the bookstore, if people do that in this day and age, like it's just overwhelming the number of choices and the number of strategies that are out there. But I think the most important thing is that, you know, number one, it's a calorie deficit. Like no matter how which, no matter which way you slice it, no matter which diet you're doing, the only way women or anybody loses weight, man or woman, is through a deficit, right? And there are better ways of, of achieving a deficit and there are dumber ways of doing it. So we've all seen the stupidest of fad diets. Like, you know, you know, when I was growing up, like there was like the cabbage soup diet and like yeah. the quote unquote Mayo Clinic diet. Like <laughs> there were just all kinds of random fad diets and there are so many more now. But the most important thing is calorie deficit. And then I think the second most important thing is for any diet to really work, keep you full, you need protein. I mean, that is, that is, at least for a lot of people, that is like having enough protein, enough vegetables and fiber is what's going to keep you full long enough to sustain a long diet. There are really terrible diets out there. And I think it's our job to know, like, and to call it out and to say, okay, you know, if you're going to do a fad diet, right, you know, um, figure it out, learn from it. And if that was not the right fad diet for you, then find something else. Just stop getting on this non-stop roller coaster or yo-yo dieting of going on one fad diet and that failed and trying another fad diet well then that failed and then another one and another one and you're just kind of constantly going on this circle like learn something from all of that and if we figured out that if fad diets are not for you then habits are the way to go like you just you know there are, habits are definitely my preference i'd rather see somebody achieve you know dietary success through you know proper nutrition and incorporating habits and lifestyle changes but if you have to do something hard and fast, at least pick a better fad diet. Like Lyle has his rapid fat loss diet, which you may have heard of, that is meant to be a crash diet, but it is super high in protein. So at least that's the saving grace. So if you're going to do something, at least incorporate protein. You know. What? How much protein do you eat a day? How often do you eat protein? <laughs> I eat all the protein. <laughs> I eat probably too much. It is my favorite thing. Like I know a lot of women don't love protein, but you don't want to know how much I consume in terms of protein. I'm not a good example of this because I love it so much. Like it is no problem for me at all to get, you know, at least 160 grams to 185 grams of protein a day. I don't even blink. Like that is super easy for me to do. So, (laughs) but that's not what I'm saying you have to do. I mean, for most women, I mean, having a serving of protein per meal would be nice, you know, somewhere around the realm of 13 to 20 grams per meal would be nice, you know, that could be anything from a cup of Greek yogurt, you know, four ounces of fish to, you know, a scoop of whey protein, that kind of stuff. Just think about having a protein at every single meal that is of a reasonable portion size. Don't go for what I do. (laughs) Don't do what I do. (laughs) So... Or do what I, I do. Yeah, or do what you do, because I think I, yeah. I think protein is a really misunderstood macronutrient that you know people well, just don't eat yeah. enough of. And as we get older, our need our need for protein increases Increase so it. much. I know we, it absolutely does increase, especially for women as they get older. Like people don't talk about that enough, but you need more protein as you get older. 
because mm -hmm. you're losing more muscle over time. So the, the more you can kind of keep enough amino acids in the bloodstream, that is a positive for you. So do something with strength training, whatever it is, however little it is, and absolutely incorporate protein at your meals. Mm, we've got this real fear of protein these days, I notice, and all mm. these myths about, you know, protein is going to cause all these cancers and heart disease, which is just completely nonsense. Right, right. I mean, if you're if you're one of the unfortunate few where I think that there are there are a few metabolic disorders that are out there that women just or people cannot have, you know, too much protein or it affects the kidneys. But those are so, so, so very rare. And most likely you're not one of them or you would know by now if you had this issue. So yeah. Yeah. it's not something to be afraid of. That's for sure. I mean, we're yeah. not saying have red meat at every single meal, but, you know, if you're a menstruating. Oh, I, female, I did. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and then there you go. Yeah, exactly. We're not saying you have to do that, but at least at least try to get a serving of red meat per week. You know, it would be nice oh. once a week. You know, if not more, like you say. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. What other tips? What what other things do you talk to your clients about, or what are the most common issues that come up with your clients? Um, I think a lot of women think that they have to be doing a lot to achieve a certain result. That's always the number one thing. They think they need to be doing, you know, um, three hours of lifting per week um, to begin. They, need, they think they need to be doing cardiovascular activity every single day. I think the number one thing is that they think they have to do it all. And that's kind of one thing I say is you absolutely don't have to. Um, if, and especially if weight loss is a goal, which is, it really is for the majority of women that I see, you know, women who are in their forties who come to me, like, I think we pretty much share the same amount, the same client base, at least as far as age goes. So we're talking about perimenopausal women or menopausal. They think that they have to be doing a lot and they believe that, um, dietary choice, dietary choices are not that important for some reason. Like they don't, they don't see the value of like, you cannot, it is far easier to create a 500 calorie deficit via dietary changes than it is to exercise that off. That is a really, that's, I know it's really <laughs> disappointing, but you just burn so little with exercise and especially with strength training, unless you're like doing hour, you know, hours of hours of lifting a day, you're probably just not burning that much with exercise, which is an unfortunate reality. And even with, you know, even with cardio, uh, I think there's a big misconception that's fueled by, you know, a lot of these companies out there who think, Oh yeah, come to my hour-long boot camp workout and burn, you know, a thousand calories. And I've seen claims as outrageous as a thousand calorie burn per workout, and even as much as six hundred to eight hundred calories per workout is completely impossible for most women. You know, for an hour-long boot camp workout, even if you're working super hard, if you are a smaller female like I am, like even for an hour-long workout, you maybe burn three hundred calories, maybe, and that's with working hard. Mm. And you know, to do that very regularly, to create a deficit via exercise every single day with 300 calories, you know, worth of a burn is easier to do with some dietary changes than having to do with exercise. I'm not saying not exercise. I'm saying absolutely do that, but just recognize that you could eat, out eat, you know, whatever it is you burned yeah. with a workout than you could via exercise. So that's definitely one of them. Um, the you other can't one, exercise a bad diet, can you? Yeah, exactly, exactly, and and I think for at least women who come to me or women who are our age, you know, that they, they um, see a lot of changes in their midsection, and so they think that you know doing you know how many more how many ab exercises do I have to do like you know to get a six pack? I'm like, oh, unfortunately, <laughs> it's like the most important thing is always going to come back to nutrition. Is you know, yes, you should definitely be training your abs, you know, but it's not as much as you think you need to do, and again, uh, it's all a function of you know what's happening in the kitchen. Mm. unfortunately i know it's a horrible message i don't yeah my message is always very boring and depressing but <laughs> it always come back to that time dedication you know consistency and what you're doing in the kitchen is probably much more important at our age than what you're doing workout wise that and i think i think the key with muscle is although you don't burn a lot of calories while you're actually working out mm. is you're burning a lot of calories the more muscle that you have. So it's far more metabolic, metabolically active. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got that, you know, sort of continuous calorie burn. And right. then muscles are good think for all the energy that comes into your body as well. Mm -hmm. So and, and I don't know how popular things are like, you know, Fitbits and activity trackers are over there, but that's another one that people 
don't realize as you get older, what's happening is you just, you know, with time, you become more sedentary. You mm -hmm. sit more at your job. And I think we give very little attention to all the other things that we're doing with our day that have nothing to do with exercise, that have nothing to do with diet, but just kind of getting up and moving forward and being a bit more uh, proactive about it. So Fitbits and activity trackers help you, you know, count how many steps you're getting per day. So, um, you know, it is, it's, if you have the means to, it's kind of nice to know where you are activity wise. So if you're the kind of person who's, you know, maybe only getting 3000 steps a day, um, trackers like that help you know, well, okay, well, can you get a bit more? Because even though you're thinking, okay, it's only 2000 more steps, it's only 5000 steps, you are burning something via steps and step counts. And that can, step count is not going to happen just via walking, but could literally be anything, gardening, mm -hmm. housework, cleaning, like if you're doing any kind of like housework, vacuuming and all that stuff, it's additive. So just little mini breaks of activity throughout the day are super, super helpful. And I think activity trackers, activity trackers help you with that, or at least awareness of that. And I think increasing popularity of standing desk helps uh -huh. a lot as yeah. well, you know, yeah. um, mm -hmm. something I highly recommend everybody have a go at, mm -hmm. trying to work at. Oh, there's so many options there. There's, there's treadmill desks, there's those little things, the stepper, yeah. like they have these stepper desks that you like and put little steppers yeah. underneath your feet while you're working. All of that adds up and it's all important as you get older. It's just move a little bit more. You don't have to do a lot more, but um, little bursts of activity throughout the day are super helpful. Mm. Mm. So tell us a little bit, just tell us a little bit about you and your powerlifting career. And, you mm -hmm. know, you're very, so, it's very inspiring. <laughs> Prior, prior to competing in powerlifting, I started when I was 40. Prior to doing that, I was doing a lot of stuff that was more aesthetics related. So I did actually do um, uh, videos and catalogs and just uh, that was more fitness modeling related. So I did a couple of apparel shoots and it was always nice because it gave me like an aesthetic goal to shoot for. Like I could always kind of, if I felt like I could, you know, kind of get to a certain goal and a certain look after a certain amount of time, I was always shooting for something that was aesthetics related, but always with the focus on muscle and being toned. Um, and I was always quite strong and I had always, always had a very strong upper body, you know, kind of probably goes back to my track and field days where I did throwing, not running. Um, so when I turned 40, I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to do fitness modeling for forever. I'm getting older. And of course now everyone on Instagram is a fitness model. So it's obviously not something that's a thing really and truly. Um, so when I turned 40, I'm like, I might as well do powerlifting because it's a, <laughs> it's a thing that people do when they're strong. <laughs> so I was lucky. I mean, I was very lucky in the fact that I had known Lyle for a very long time. I had at first, when I was considering it, I had hired a, um, an online trainer and I went to my first meet with him as my online coach, but things are just very different with powerlifting, especially if, you know, if you have any quirks in your biomechanics that make you squat a certain way, which I do, or bench a certain way, whatever. It's, it's always good to have somebody who's kind of with you and monitoring you. And I had known Lyle, of course, from his books, many, many years to knowing him as a friend. So I've known him for over a decade as a friend first and knew him through the industry. And when he, when I moved prior to moving to Austin, I had reached out to him because I said, Hey, I, I know you're in Austin. Um, do you know anybody, you know, I had moved from Washington, DC, another state here. So, um, I said, do you know anybody who's looking for uh, trainers because I needed a job? And he goes, yeah, sure, come on down and I'll meet you. And so we met, so we kind of knew each other over the years and he took me, or he came with me to my first meet and he's like, you know what, if you're going to lift that way, you really need me to handle you because you know what you're doing is, <laughs> it, it was kind of a tragedy and at least my first meet was, my first competition was. And from there he took it on. He's like, I'll just coach you and we'll figure this out. And we were a very, we are, we continue to be a very successful team. So together we've set uh, several state and national records and a couple of world, world records in different powerlifting federations. So that's been very fun and very rewarding. And yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll stick with that for as long as, as long as my body will let me. Um, so while things are, well, things are well, I'd rather ride the tide and uh, enjoy this for as long as it lasts. Cause you just never know what can happen in this industry and in your life. So it's been yeah. very rewarding. Yeah, that's fantastic. So where can people find you? Where can they get your book? And again, I really want to emphasize while you talk about mom strong and, and the initial time after childbirth, it's really for any, any woman out there wanting to get started on their fitness journey. 
So um, the book is for sale on Lyle's website, which is bodyrecomposition.com. And he's got a, a web store with all of his books and he's included mine um, just because he's done all the, like the videos and the photographs for that book. Um, I'm on Instagram at Shyla Fitness and that's my daughter's name. My daughter, her name Shyla means strength and confidence. So I named my personal training business after her. So it's at Shyla Fitness and I'm on Facebook as Sumi Singh, which I'm Sure, there are probably many by now, but I'm I'm the one that looks super, super mean. I've got that classic RBF face, they say. So <laughs> that's the one. So oh, that's brilliant. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to share with everybody? I would say, you know, whatever it is you do, just start today, start small because one good habit will lead to another. So just start. That would be my advice. Oh, that's fantastic. Hey, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And you're a very kick-ass, inspiring woman. Thank you so much. Thank, same to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's awesome that there are women of all, like, of all ages who are getting the message. It's never too late to start. So whether yeah. it's from women who are in their 40s to 50s to 60s, we have to get that message out that there is always a good time to start, and it's probably today. So look, I know women in their 70s who have started lifting weights at the gym and they're they're really lifting some you know they're deadlifting and lifting some really bloody heavy weights and awesome. those, are, those are life goals that's what I want to do too oh, yeah and then you know and they're learning to do chin-ups and things like that you know in their yeah. 70s I mean it's just it's just amazing and I just want that for every woman you know same. yes I agree yeah. same yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you so much. And we'll make sure we put links for everyone to find your book and know where to find you and follow your work and really appreciate your time.